Oh, man. I'm telling you. If you're going to run the pay-per-views this late, can we at least do it on a Saturday night? Is that too much to ask? And here come the Brits, I'm sure. Saying, you bloody wanker. <laughs> Bitching and moaning when they got to stay up to like 4 or 5 a.m. for this shit. Well, you take your British fist and you stuff it. Because you're going to do what Americans do best. Make it about me. And play the victim. Yeah, that's what we do. I'll tell you what. AEW certainly went all out with this show tonight. And apparently, the future is now. Maybe the real tagline should be, Russell like there's no tomorrow, because everyone we feature, there might not be. <laughs> Anyways, certainly a buzzworthy night for this company. A lot of you, I'm sure, are incredibly excited about what you just saw, whether you paid for the $49.99 to watch it on pay-per-view like I did, or you did not. Anyways, let's get to it. Let's talk about this show. All Out, main card kicks off with the TNT Championship, Eddie Kingston versus Miro. It was a good brawl. Uh, the ref being the heel here felt weird. If that means that we get another match down the road between these guys, I'm okay with that. Cool. Decent opener. Crowd was into it. Not everything needs to be a flippy fucky spot fest. It's cool. And to be fair to this show, I will say this. It wasn't that type of show, and that's a good thing. It was more varied in terms of the card and the presentation. There were different types of wrestlers, different types of matches. That was good. Uh, Moxley versus Kojima. I knew going into this, and even talked about it in the preview, tweeted about it. This was not for me. I knew it, but after watching this match, was it really for the hardcore fans? that this was designed for. I mean, it was okay, but did you really feel like this was a super gratifying dream matchup? Like, I still feel this is a waste of Moxley. Like, he shouldn't be in this dream matchup spot. He's better suited as a talent, you know, doing extreme style grudge matches and hardcore fights. That's the type of guy he is. Like, this type of stuff, I don't think it works for him. It's not utilizing the talent to the best of his potential. And furthermore, if Minoru Suzuki was going to be there, why the hell wasn't he just the opponent? You know? Now, if the opponent would have been Ishii, my entire approach and philosophy about this match would have changed exponentially, believe me. But other than that, it was just okay, but it was certainly a match could have done without and not a match that anybody's really going to remember. The AEW Women's Championship, they both survived relatively unscathed, which when it comes to a Chris Botchlander match of any kind, that's a miracle. Hallelujah! I was waiting with bated breath the entire time. There were one or two sloppy moments, but pretty clean for who, considering who was in this match. I'm still not getting why she's an alien and does no alien things, not understanding why she's booping Britt Baker's snoot like she's a fucking pooch or a puppy or something. But Baker retains, good. Moving on, next. The AEW Tag Team Championship Steel Cage match was perfectly positioned, I felt, in the middle of the show. Like, this was well-placed. And I thought, in general, when you look at the entirety of how the show was structured, I thought Tony Khan did a good job of mapping this out. I thought the flow was good. I still have some thoughts about what really should have main evented this show at the end of the day, but... The flow was good here, and this was incredibly well positioned in the middle of the card. Lucha Bros versus the Bucks of Suck. Like, this is a typical Bucks of Suck, Lucha Bros spot fest. You know this doesn't resonate with me. You know this match has no psychology. You know it's fucking stupid because they're just sitting there doing a bunch of extreme shit, and all they're trying to do is, a, you can, t can you top this type of crap? Oh, I got thumbtacks on the fucking Jordans. Oh, hoo -hoo. And then, of course, as typical with one of these matches, the finish is so much less spectacular than five or seven other spots you saw during the damn match. But that said, this show probably actually needed this match to be like this. Sometimes that's okay. When you don't have a card or a show full of these types of matches, it can work. It worked here. 
crowd really was eager to see the Lucha Bros win. They really wanted this to happen. And as a result, they're going to look past the really stupid looking spot where you've got one guy on top of the cage and three guys standing around like jackasses. They're going to overlook all that stuff. And like I said, the way this show was structured, the way it went, the matches that you had, you actually, I can't believe I'm saying this, you needed this type of match on this show. It was good for what this show needed. It gave it a kickstart. It gave it something different. It gave it some life. Uh, the Casino Battle Royal, Jade Cargill, I was impressed with the fact that she got a big pop. I was kind of irritated when they had Nyla Rose Eliminator. Fuck that. And fuck this match. But it was probably necessary. So you can have a powerhouse versus powerhouse feud between the two of them. You know, but I was a little disappointed Thunder Rosa didn't win. Yes, but I understand. Oh, it's Ruby Soho and the initial reaction is mid to mild. Certainly, I wouldn't describe it as mild. Crowd was into it as it went along, though. I get it here. I get, I get why you had Ruby Soho win. Do I personally think that a lot of people have overrated her compared to her actual work in WWE? Oh, fuck yeah. But she's a fresh face, you know, and fuck anybody else on the roster. You're just putting her right towards the top, huh? <laughs> so she gets the title shot against Britt Baker. But the, the Battle Royal was pretty good. The, the one gripe I would have had is for some of the more featured prominent performers, like what you did with Ruby Soho, I would like you to feature some of the entrances more. Like Jade Cargill should be presented like a star. Thunder Rosa should be presented like a star. Ty Conti should be presented like a star. I understand with the format of the match that it makes it a little harder to do that, but you gotta figure out a better way to do so. Because those small touches matter and make a difference. Um, the career on the line match, MJF versus Chris Jericho. It's amazing to me what happens when the crowd really cares about the stakes and what could potentially happen. Because it allows you to work a more traditional match. It allows you to keep it relatively basic. You can focus on actually working a clear-cut heel and babyface dynamic. Isn't it amazing how sometimes you keep it simple, stupid, and this shit really works? This really worked. Um, the finish, though? Really, Aubrey? Like that, that was kind of a wet dud of a fart. Which, as soon as that happened, you're like, oh, Chris Jericho's going to win. And all I'll say is I'm glad that the promising 50-year-old went over a hot heel fucking on this show. Like, it's good to see some of the young talent going over. But a lot of fans, I think, even the hardcore AEW fans, are like, well, what the fuck's the point of all of this? Like, can we move the fuck on from this? It's a fair question. But most importantly of all, the young promising 50-year-old got the win here. The future is now! CM Punk versus Darby Allen was next. Clearly, CM Punk doesn't stand for Cardio Machine. He had some ring rust. He wasn't in the best of shape based off of what I saw. He was about what I expected. Um, I don't really care. Like a lot of people are talking about get rid of the tights and go to the trunks. That, I, that doesn't matter to me. Um, probably it was better that he was in what he was in. Like I said, the match was about what I expected. You know, Darby was there to bump around a lot for Punk and make him look good and sell some of his shit. That's what happened. Um, CM Punk wins, you know, and the, and the crowd obviously was really behind this. This match was kind of slow initially. It moved slow, but it needed to by design. You have to work up to it. You have to take your time. You don't need to rush. You don't need to go too fucking crazy here. Because the match and the appeal is CM Punk's first match in seven and a half years. It's not about anything else. Now, you could have ended this show with this as the main event because you did the whole nice spot of sportsmanship with Darby Allen eventually getting the props. So even though CM Punk's going over, he's still putting over Darby Allen. But we don't give a shit about this. We're just happy that 43 year old CM Punk won his first match in seven and a half years. That's a big deal. And more importantly, more importantly, I feel like I got hoodwinked and bamboozled here. Bamboozled! Because when I saw Sting come out, I'm saying, oh, is he pulling the Hogan, brother? He's saying, the hell with Darby Allen. Let's do Sting and CM Punk here. But let's make the stage, the setting and the matter even more important. Let's make the stakes even higher. 
How about it be Sting versus CM Punk for the Impact World title at Bound for Glory? You guys have your dreams, and I have mine. And don't you dare fucking ruin them. That's right. The hell with Darby Allen. Sting is a ripe, low 60s guy. Like, he can still go in great shape. So, the future is now. Wrestle like there's no tomorrow, because there might not be. You know what I mean? And at first, my reaction to Paul White versus QT Marshall was, do we really need this, on this fucking pay-per-view? It's already long enough. You know, I understand sometimes you put in these these placeholders, these spot fillers, to serve a purpose. That said, thank you, Tony Khan, as I think about it and thought about it. Thank you for the piss break. I really appreciate that. And I'm also really glad that the 49-year-old young lion is going over here. Because now it's about to be two tickets to the gun show. Let's talk about Paul White and Billy Gunn, baby. <laughs> the future is now. Wrestle like your life depends on it. Wrestle like there's no tomorrow. Either this roster and who's getting pushed right now, that might be true. Which brings us to the AEW World Championship. You know, I used to sit there and watch years ago and say, Christian Cage... You know, that guy could do something someday. He might just have a chance. If he toils away and works really hard for 20, 25, 30 years, you know, he might get a shot at a world title by the time he's 47. And lo and behold, here we were it all out. He's got it. Christian Cage, Kenny Omega, let's be real. While these guys have good chemistry together, while these guys can tell a decent story in a match, while these guys can have some really good matches, the crowd only kind of cared because knowing that this match was the main event, they knew that something bigger was coming. So it's like one of those yeah, but things. Yeah, CM Punk's match should have main evented because the show All Out was supposed to be about him and his return in Chicago. That should be enough. But... If you were going to go where you ended up going, it makes sense why you did what you did. And what did we find out after the main event's over and Kenny Omega wins? And Adam Cole can still stream on Twitch while wrestling. Bye-bye! Because -bye. everybody's thinking that it's going to be Brian Danielson, the American Dragon, that comes out. And, and Adam Cole, he came out instead. As an 8-track Genetti, one of my Twitter followers said, you should follow him too because this is fucking classic. He said I can eat a dick. They only care about Brian Danielson. It's Adam Cole, baby! Eat a dick! <laughs> like, it was one of those weird things where you felt like the crowd was getting trolled, but they were cool with it. And then just as you think that's the end of it because Adam Cole... Super kicks Jungle Jack Perry because, again, for some reason, we've always got to make him the fucking big deal here. Out comes Brian Danielson to some really shitty entrance music. Oh, God, that was bad. But Brian Danielson walks out looking like he just got done shopping at Whole Foods for bringing the kids for the fucking week. And he's here at All Elite. That's right, baby. Yes! 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 Also, as 8-Track Janetti said, Daniel Bryan's not even in his 50s yet. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. That's the new standard for all leg white wrestling. <laughs> if you're in your 40s, you're in the peak and prime of your career, damn it! Push him straight to the fucking moon. Because Adam Cole is one thing. CM Punk is one thing. But when you talk about incessant bro man love of a wrestler... When it comes to the hardcore fan base, there is nobody. And the Schleg Daddy emphasizes again, absolutely nobody that this community stands for, bends over backwards for, marks out for, says crazy irrational hyped up shit for more than the American Dragon Brian Danielson. Your only disappointment is probably that he didn't shoot flames out of his mouth or out of his ass. 
And you're going to say, well, that sounds stupid. But you guys believe in the American Dragon Brian Danielson so much, so you probably expected it to fucking happen. But Brian Danielson makes his anticipated AEW debut and just going to show that the future is now. He's only 40, like he's just entering the peak and prime of his physical career. Yeah! And that was the closing scene of AEW All Out. And the name was fitting. At least I could say, if you're going to call a show All Out, you better go All Out. And AEW clearly went All Out as much as they could have for this show. The bringing in the Ruby Sohos, the bringing in of the Adam Coles and Daniel Bryans, having CM Punk back with in wrestling, and wrestling his first match in seven and a half years. Throwing Adam Cole and Brian Danielson into the same damn spot at the end of the night. They went all out. But will it pay off? How do you follow up on this? Like, I know. There's going to be lots of flaming keyboard fingers of fire comments because people are so caught up in their excitement and their buzz. But the reality is, is... Well, I understand there may have been other factors at play. You know, we had been thinking about for a long time, Daniel Bryan's going to debut at the Arthur Ashe show. But then you maybe have some COVID-related concerns about whether or not you're going to do the show there. And you're going to be able to do it, but is that going to be the place you're going to be able to debut him? Do you need to debut him sooner? Blah, 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 blah. I get all that. Like, sometimes you have to pounce while you can. But how do you follow up on this? It really feels like you blew all your load here. Interesting strategy if you're trying to entice fans to fork over the $49.99 to watch the pay-per-views because you're saying, hey, you know, this is worth it. You don't want to miss this. You want to experience this. I get it. But then you also have a TV show and that product is something that you also need to manage that is the base of everything that you do. It is the core fundamental cog in the wheel of your entire operation. And now you just debuted a bunch of talent tonight on the pay-per-view instead of spreading out maybe one or two of them a week or two from now on Dynamite or Rampage. Like, why not have Brian Danielson come out tonight and then Adam Cole come out a week or two or a month later? You didn't have to go there. Even once you did the Adam Cole thing, like, almost makes you wonder, like, you could have done without the Brian Danielson piece tonight. Because so many people would have been so focused on Adam Cole, they would have made excuses and justifications and defenses for that. They'd have been like, I oh, would we'll just wait until the Arthur Ashe show, or we'll wait until later on. Yeah. Like, sometimes you can go too hard on one show. And at some point in time, this shit doesn't matter so much, because you've seen this happen with other talents, too. Like, oh my god, they brought Andrade, and that's such a big deal. Except he was cutting a crappy promo tonight during the show, didn't have a match. They've done shit with him since he's come. Malachi Black is great and he's awesome and he's such an unutilized talent in WWE. He's going to come here and do great things. Except he also did not have a fucking match on this pay-per-view. I'm just saying. Like, the echo chamber of the internet wrestling community, but specifically the hardcore AEW fan base, obviously are going to be very excited tonight. And they should be, because this was a show for them, a show designed for them to love, and they absolutely loved it. Good for them. Happy for them. But damn, you also look at this show and you say, you know, all of my cracks and jokes tonight about the future is now. Wrestle like there's no tomorrow, because there might not be. You had a 50-year-old Chris Jericho beating your young top heel in MJF, you're talking about 49-year-old Paul White getting a pay-per-view match and winning tonight, going on second to last in terms of match order, 47-year-old Christian is main eventing after he's already beaten Kenny Omega once, 43-year-old CM Punk is wrestling another like young up-and-coming babyface, and you have him go over him, and then you have 40-year-old Brian Danielson appearing in the main event. I know 40 is a youth, new 30, blah, 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 goddamn. Like he's just further pushing other people down the roster. And if we want to talk about all egg white type of shit here for All Out, like, this is getting kind of ridiculous. 
I imagine they celebrated with mayonnaise and potato salad with raisins and chess games all around. Get catering. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Very pearly at the top of this company. Looks awfully familiar to me. You know, I almost call it A-E-W-W-E all out based off the way this thing fucking looked tonight. I mean, it is what it is. I, I had fun tonight, you know, and sometimes my fun admittedly comes from different things than you. What, I, what, what irritates me a little bit sometimes about it admittedly is that when people get upset because I didn't enjoy it the same way that they, they did. Well, fuck you. I don't have to. Sometimes I enjoy being snarky. Sometimes I enjoy things that I can mock and make fun of. But that doesn't necessarily lessen my enjoyment or viewing experience just because it's not the same as yours. I felt like the $49.99 was worth it. Was it as worth it as sparklers? No. Hell no. Absolutely not. But it was worth it nonetheless. Now you're going to hear some crazy off the wall batshit stuff over the next 24 to 48 hours from a bunch of understandably excited wrestling fans and lots of biased wrestling journalists. And we use that term very, very loosely in today's wrestling world. Oh God, they're going to be talking about how this is the greatest show ever. They're going to talk about how this is the show that changed everything. They're going to talk about how this moved the needle and how da da da. And they're going to keep bringing up WWE when it shouldn't fucking matter and all of this other shit. And the reality is stop letting your emotions of the moment allow recency bias to take the fucking over. Sometimes it's best to compartmentalize and think about things when you remove some of the emotion from it. As a little bit after the show, watching different people's takes, like there's some good, well thought out takes, but those are few and far between. There were a lot of dumb, batshit, irrational, emotional, crazy, you sound like a moron type of tweets. There really were. And this coming from a guy who's been prone to a number of those over the years. So pot, meat, kettle, but more importantly, I know game when I fucking peak game. Just saying. Special props to Kenny Omega for making sure that if I'm going to get the facial hair like God, then by God, I'm going to do some elite politics and I'm going to be wrestling that main event, dude. And then you're going to bring in Adam Cole and Brian Danielson around me. Now, I was some cleaner shit right there. My respect for that. But you can feel free to tell me in the comments what you thought of AEWWE all out. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> How dare you insult my viewing experience? Daniel Bryan is here. Brian Danielson can sit there and milk an ox and squash a grizzly bear with the same hand. You say that's not physically possible? Well, fuck you. He's going to shoot flames out of his ass next week on Dynamite. Oh, God, here we go. Anybody check on Deluxe Man? Is he still alive? I'd be surprised if he yerked himself to death. Like, almost as bad as Melter and Apple Res. No, 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 nobody's that bad. Like, you could even see, like, throughout the day... Dave Meltzer, is this pay-per-view going to do 200 plus thousand buys? Brian Alvarez, as soon as one match happens, he has an instant response. Like, this is the greatest tag team match of all time. Oh, fuck you. God. We can have fun without always having to use these reactionary hyperboles. It's fucking ridiculous, man. All this hyperbole of this is the greatest ever. Golly. But anyways, let me know if you enjoyed this show or not. Let me know if you're down for AEW's youth movement. Because that's what we got here, folks. The future is now. Wrestle like there's no tomorrow. It's looking at the guys being pushed at all egg white wrestling. That might be the damn case.